apologies. We'll try and catch up now um, on a little bit of time. I, uh, okay, cool. Uh, I'm just getting uh, into my drift here. So, okay, so I wanted to call this talk tonight, People of the Broch, because it's all too easy to forget the people. When you're in the midst of excavating, when you're involved in highly technical processes of excavation, when you're studying and scrutinizing archaeological issues like stratigraphy and radiocarbon dates and isotopes and various other sorts of technical processes, it can be all too easy to get drawn away from the actual point of the whole exercise, which is, of course, to try to understand human societies in the past and in the remote past, in this particular case of the Iron Age. <clears throat> There's kind of two ways into thinking about people, I suppose, in very broad and very simplistic terms. On the one hand, you could say there's people and their place in the archaeology, and particularly in settlement archaeology, which is the particular type of archaeology, I suppose, that I practice most often in the trench, where I'm excavating settlements and houses, villages uh, of one kind or another. Those inhabitations are usually not that full up with the human beings themselves, of course. And so they act as a kind of proxy evidence for um, the nature of, of human conditions, human practices, social practices and activities. And then the other thing, the other way in to think about people is when you're lucky enough, if that's quite the right phrase, to come into intimate contact with the remains of those people, with human remains themselves. And of course, as I've said already in settlement archeology, span it's not, it's fairly seldom that you come into contact with the very, individuals who have inhabited that settlement. Over the time that we've been excavating at the Cairns, however, we have come face to face with a few scraps of people, as it were, in the course of our excavation. And many of you will know a little bit about some of those items. And we're currently engaged in a program of research and analysis where we're getting more and more information about those people. And I want to tell you a little bit about them tonight. And I also want to think about those social conditions that those people in their place and the residues and the remains that they've left that give us an insight into the activities by way of a, a discussion about our site at the Cairns. This is where the Cairns is, South Ronald, say southernmost of the um, uh, larger of the islands of the archipelago of Orkney, of course. We're down here, southeast South Ronald, in case, in case anyone doesn't know. Uh, here's a, a little zoom in here. The red star indicates where we are. So we're not on the coast. We're a bit further back from the coast, about 400 metres away from uh, the shoreline and 42 metres above sea level. It's a classic Orcadian site in the sense that it, although it's over 2,000 years old at heart, it's still incredibly well preserved. We have deeply stratified, very well preserved architectural uh, remains. We have um, walls of buildings that stand still above my head height. And if that weren't good enough, in a sense, we also have fully three dimensional buildings in the sense that we even have underground structures that are fully roofed over. Um, this is a bit of a view from the site. It's a lovely, a lovely view it is too, uh, down to Winnick Bay. They're looking out to the North Sea. And this slide is a few years old now in terms of what, when it was taken on site. And we've come on a long way in the main trench since this point in time, but it does nevertheless convey a nice sense of the landscape. As well as looking out to the landscape, we've also worked intensively into the site itself and even discovered this thing, this wonderful underground structure beneath the floor of the, the brock itself, a so-called well, um, very well preserved, two metre deep rock cut subterranean structure, complete with a flight of stairs that leads down into the structure. And, and it's, in, it's in the matrix of all of these remains and structures that from time to time we've encountered fragments of people, as it were, bits and pieces of human beings left in a variety of different circumstances and for various different reasons, perhaps, and they will give us an invaluable insight into the, the humanity of the site itself. Um, uh, okay, and um, so I'll just um, move on, shall I, to this video, just to give a sense of heft of the site. The broch, the principal five meter wall, circular, and metal shelf, as well as the trench, the village buildings that surround the broch. 
few project facts, very simple things. 13 seasons of excavation, almost terrifying, really, when I think about it. Um, a half a career's worth of, of excavation in terms of field, uh, field career lives, I suppose. Um, 21 Iron Age buildings or more that we've wholly or partly excavated and engaged with in that time. Thousands of artifacts, thousands of hand-recovered animal bones, very significantly. Very good bone preservation on site, which is very helpful to us, of course. And we've lifted a, a large volume. We've taken a large volume of environmental samples from across the site to try to understand things um, like the, the environment that people were living in. It's also a classic Orcadian site in being very rich in terms of artifactual material, of, of material, portable material culture in that sense. So metal objects like this um, bronze ring, lovely bone objects like decorated uh, long handled combs, uh, stone objects, spindle whorls, uh, loom weights fired clay molds for producing bronze items, rotary querns, very, very rich ceramic uh, assemblage as well. So things that we would normally expect, I suppose, to a greater or lesser extent on well-preserved uh, Iron Age sites in the north of Scotland. But there's also more exceptional items as well, like a wee heat, uh, our little carved anthropomorphic figure, more on he or she in a little while, um, a fully preserved wooden bowl, uh, and even uh, even um, fibres of human hair preserved down in that well-like structure. Many of you will know about these from various posts and news items over the recent years. And there's just a little picture of that beautiful wooden bowl. And if you want to see some of these artefacts in the flesh, as it were, at the moment, right the way up to the end of October, shameless plug here, uh, you can visit Strumness Museum and you can go in there and you can see the exhibition that's currently running, has been uh, for a couple of weeks now and runs to the end of October and it's the Cairns Living in the Landscape exhibition. So do go along if you have the chance and if you're in Orkney, go and have a look and see for yourselves. Okay, well without any further ado, let's go into our two streams as it were, two strands of, of evidence for thinking about the people of the Cairns and in this strand I want to talk about the people themselves, so those fragmentary disarticulated portions of human remains um, that I alluded to a moment ago and what I want to do here is show you some pictures and because of that I do want to warn you that I will show you some pictures of skeletonized human remains. I don't think there's anything too scary or offensive involved in them but I think it's, it's worthwhile letting you know that I'm about to show you some pictures of, uh, of those human remains so if you want to, to avoid that you can look away now. So the first of our individuals is someone that we've for long enough since 2015 got used to calling person A. And this is a fragment of jawbone, uh, a mandible, so the lower jaw of an individual that was found in rather extraordinary circumstances, found in inside a, a, a hollowed out whalebone vertebra, a carved, uh, large carved whalebone vertebra, positioned just outside the entrance to the broch, at the time when the broch was going out of use, was being abandoned and mothballed. And this individual from the traditional human remains analysis that's been undertaken on them, such as we can peer into the life of this person based on a single bone and, a, and, and the mandible here, this person seems to have been very old for the Iron Age, um, between 50 years old and 70 years old, plus, 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 it's difficult to really put a bracket on that because the older an individual gets in the archaeological record, the, the fewer biological markers they lay down to reveal just how old they actually are. So this, this person might um, be across that quite broad age range. And of course, that's not particularly or not necessarily very old in our society to, today, but for the Iron Age, it was, it seems it was of a, a considerable age. This person had hardly any teeth left. Um, in the jaw, and most of the teeth had been resorbed in the gum line, showing that they'd lost most of those teeth in life, and that the, the jawbone had healed around them and had resorbed around the sockets, as it were. So very few teeth left in the in the jaw itself. Here's a, an image of the circumstances that I was just describing within which it was found. And this seems to have been part of a very elaborate sequence of of ending the broch and leaving cl uh, closing deposits at the end of the the broch round about ad 200 so towards the end of the second century perhaps just into the early third century ad uh, this elaborate uh, this large carved whalebone vessel two red deer antlers propped against it three neonatal lambs placed inside uh, as well as a, a number of shells and fish bones 
the human jawbone of person A themselves, um, and then a large saddle quern propped against the thing, almost as if to 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 um, position it tightly against the outer broch wall. Then some large slabs were placed on the thing and huge amounts of rubble were placed both inside and outside the rubble. Now we now know, and this is the first of our DNA insights that we gained a few years ago now, we now know that the fin wheel vessel, which is this one over here, this is a plan of the broch and this is the fin wheel vessel over here. We now know that it has counterparts all across the broch inside the broch and inside various chambers within the broch um, which belong to the same individual or very likely from the DNA evidence belong to the, the very same individual this large but still not quite adult fin whale um, who presumably stranded about 2000 years ago probably in the Bay of Winnick itself uh, and this is their carcass having been disposed of and cut up chopped up and used and apparently deliberately deposited in an even more elaborate act of closure, marking the end of the broch. Quite remarkable, really. The, the person A also had <laughs> some severe problems with their teeth. Now, we can't say anything about the teeth that were lost, but we can certainly look at the teeth that, that remained with the jaw, and we can see this hideous gash that runs round about the gum line, or would have been where the gum line was in life. And you can see what a, a horrible dental carry that, that actually is. It's a great gouge out of the tooth. And it could have been extremely painful. It could easily have also led to infection or been infected. And it could easily have, have led to septicemia and maybe serious infection that, that then would have gone through the body and actually might have led to the demise of person A themselves. The teeth are very flat. There's very few cusps left on this molar. So the, the pointed cusp uh, portions of the tooth have been worn down, probably a combination of a very gritty diet that this person was consuming, like most Iron Age people. Their, the flour uh, to bake into bread is ground on querns, which are themselves quite uh, made of sandstone or are quite gritty. Some of those particles of sandstone get into the flour, they're baked into the bread, and then people are consuming that, and it's and that grittiness is helping to grind down their teeth. But there's another another factor involved in this as well. Very likely, this person was involved in various tooth tasks, shall we say? That's to say, using the jaw like a third hand to grip materials, things like leather or grasswork or basketry, gripping them in their in their in their jaw and then manipulating those with their hands. Um, uh, so effectively like a third a third hand. And between those actions, this person was left with very few um, teeth in their jaws, as you've just seen. So <clears throat> this might have even militated towards this person's ultimate demise. Um, it's not entirely clear. The, the radiocarbon dating for this individual also, at the same time, allowed us to peer into their other isotopes within their body, carbon and nitrogen isotopes, and it allowed us to see that for the Iron Age period, this person had a surprisingly high marine protein content to their diet. And we don't know whether that, we still at this moment don't quite know whether that's to do with the fact that this the, a, a, a fish diet or a marine mollusk diet may have been easier for this person to consume given the ravaged state of their, their uh, dental health or whether this person had consumed marine protein throughout their life course and we're hoping very soon that we'll get some information back from that from this project because whoops we're currently working with the Comios project a project that's based at the University of York with European and other funding and it's looking at over 150 individuals of the Iron Age period from Britain and the near continent in order to peer into things like um, ancestry, connectedness, kinship, mobility and diet and health as well. And we're very lucky to be participating in the Comios project. And what that means is that we're getting DNA information. So we're getting genetic information for the human fragments, the human bone from the site. And at the same time, we're also getting um, dietary isotopic information as well, and much more complex and sophisticated new techniques of looking at dietary aspects where we're looking, where they're able to look at the, the greater, longer life course of the individual to see whether or not, for instance, or person A was consuming uh, marine protein just towards the end of their life or whether it was across the whole of their lifespan or a large part of their lifespan. So we're very lucky to be involved in that for sure. <clears throat> 
Now, as a preliminary to the COMUAS results, we already have been getting some data and some information back, which is really, really helpful, because we can now say that person A is confirmed as being biologically a woman, her biological sex was a woman. Um, and we have called person A the elder because of the the, uh, the gerontic nature of, of this person's lifespan. Uh, and with thanks to Cecily Webster here, she's actually produced a little reconstruction drawing or rather um, an imaginative drawing for the most part, given that we have very little physiological detail other than that lower mandible. But I like to think this at least gives us some kind of humanity and dignity to this individual. I'll talk a little bit more about person A in a little while later on, so we'll come back to person A, but I want to move on to person B. And here I've nicknamed them the feaster. <laughs> uh, if, if the elder was characterised by aspects of uh, dentition and health and diet, then this individual is similarly so. And, in, and would you believe this is this person is represented in our archaeological record from the site merely by the presence of a single human molar tooth? And this is it here. And it comes from the west room of the Brock interior, from floor deposits excavated in the west room of the Brock interior. And you can see, well, at least I think you can probably gauge that there's a considerable amount of calculus that's mineralized ossified back that's accreted onto the tooth around the gum line, above the gum line and, and uh, folding over uh, the tooth in that way. This person uh, is uh, also the subject of analysis by the Comios uh, analysis project and we now know from that analysis um, some preliminary results merely that this person was male that biologically speaking, this uh, the sex of this individual was male. Now, this tooth um, is being studied for both its uh, inherent aspects of dietary um, isotopes by uh, looking into the pulp inside the tooth and analysing that, but also um, the proteomics, the details of the of the the calculus itself to get a, a nice fine tuned understanding of what this person was consuming during their life, um, and presumably this tooth is is either an accidental loss in the course of this individual's life. So this isn't this isn't from someone. This isn't that funerary remains in that sense, uh, in the way that the the elder person A was was dead at the point in time where they're deposited where the job owner is deposited. In this case, this, this is possibly accidental loss of the tooth in that Western room. And we might see some reasons why this person lost their tooth when we peer into the dynamics of what was going on in that West room in a little while. So I'll show you some details of that, of the activities and the practices that were going on in there uh, in just a moment. Now, just as an aside for a second, just to explain disarticulated remains in Iron Age Scotland, there are quite a considerable amount of them. We have very, very uh, fugitive traces of inhumations of formal burial as such. We have very few cemeteries um, and we have very few uh, single inhumation graves where the whole body is present. And there has traditionally been a bit of a mystery and a bit of mystification and a bit of of um, uh, kind of uh, a, a bit of a debate really about where the dead are in the Iron Age. The dead, the, the Iron Age is so full of the evidence of the living in the form of farmsteads and houses and closures um, and ways that people were operating across the landscape in life. It's vibrant with life as an archeological record in that sense, but the remains of the dead have always been quite fugitive and difficult to apprehend. And by far and away, we find the majority of fragments of people from the Iron Age in settlement contexts as disarticulated fragments or semi-articulated bundles of bone, <clears throat> usually apparently formally deposited. And this is from Fiona Tucker's thesis, just to show some of the, the distribution of these. There's a very significant number of disarticulated human remains from Orkney itself, for instance, but also in Caithness and out in the Outer Hebrides and in Skye as well. And also from Fiona's thesis, PhD thesis, she also drew this evidence together to look at the spatiality, the locational aspects of these disarticulated remains. So this is a schematic Iron Age roundhouse and in it she's she's plotted all the instances that she had good information for from older excavations in terms of where they appeared, uh, in terms of the, the direction and the location and the portion of the of the houses and in this particular case you can see 
<clears throat> the entrances, both inside and outside entrances, are particularly uh, frequently the site of uh, disarticulated deposits. So to that extent, our personnel or jawbone is very much in good company in that regard, because there does seem to be a tendency, a trend, a particular social or cultural practice, a preference for placing the dead in and around the entrance portions. And that probably relates to the fact that <clears throat> in most non-Western societies, it has to be said, entrances betwixt and between in those locations, I'll, I'll use an overused word, the liminality of these boundary locations where those boundaries are perforated, uh, where there's an entrance, where there's an ex access and egress, these are often hedged around with taboos, restrictions, and cultural behaviours and practices of one kind or another. So we can perhaps come back to that later on when we zoom out to think about uh, social practices on the site. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, whoops. Oh, it's dragging its feet, folks. Let's see if we can get it to come back the way. Uh, it's so laggy that I daren't touch it before it mucks up again. I'll give it a second to recover itself and hopefully it'll wipe its feet and then I'll and that will allow me to to uh, push on. Ah, here we go. Again, the blue circle of death at the moment, so hopefully it'll it'll shift on in a second. Right, okay. Now the <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon, folks, if you hear my disgruntled grunting. Oh, someone's answering the phone in the background. <laughs> Hi, folks. I wonder if you could, if you um, could remember Martin, to... Uh, Martin Carruthers doing a lovely uh, OAS talk about the care. Hello. Of... Hello. Zoom. Hi, hi. You, I, we can hear you on the phone. I'll give you a call, shall I, as soon as it finishes. Okay, no. <laughs> can folks hear me okay? Hello? Yep, you're Hello. Yeah, we're hi, hi, David. I, can, shall I just make a quick um, kind of remedial announcement, which is that folks, if you could mute your mic when you're not speaking later on, because um, we could just hear your phone call just a second ago there folks so that'd be grand okay it seems to have recovered a little bit um and then the other form in which human remains have come to us on site are these are remarkable organic preservation of uh fibers of human hair and at the moment i'll pass over them fairly quickly but we have we, we don't have huge amounts of evidence for what these what these are telling us um simply because um the isotopic analysis of these hasn't come back yet as um pieces of organic hair that are preserved in waterlogged conditions they are remarkable evidence or will give us remarkable evidence for incremental dietary and health information. So one centimetre's growth of hair uh, represents about a month of a person's life. And since each of these uh, 30 to 35 hair fibres are in the region of 10 to 12 centimetres long, then they give us 10 to 12 months of information, incremental information over the life course of that individual. But we don't have the results of that yet. But I'm, I'm really keen to get those results back. I'll let you know when we have information. What I can say is that there's at least two individuals represented and that they had their hair cut immediately before it was deposited in the so-called well structure. And that that happened, we think, uh, a good while before the end of the brock this wasn't a closing deposit in this case this is something going on that leads to hair being deposited down there underneath the brock during the the time that the brock is inhabited and occupied it would seem uh, so sometime perhaps early in the early in the first to mid uh, first century ad um and as you can see there's two two types here they're both cut um and uh, that seems quite interesting and curious to have synchronized haircuts in that sense, but uh, we'll move on. And then a final way in which human 
human beings are being visible to us in a slightly more direct fashion on site is through the expressive depiction. And this is incredibly unusual to get this kind of evidence from the the middle or the early part of the way. Iron Age figurative art, literal art that represents human beings in that sense. So here you've got this carved human head that I mentioned at the beginning of the, the session, beginning of the lecture. And you've got this incredible um, <laughs> incredible uh, face that stares back at us. Uh, and again, you can see this in the Strumness Museum if you want to go and look at that exhibition. But whether this represents a, an ancestral being, a supernatural entity, or whether indeed it's just a gaming piece, um, of which there are quite a number from the contexts that this um, a carved head was uh, came from, then, you know, who knows, but it does seem to represent as expressive um, in some sense of a anthropoid form in that sense. Um, okay. Now, I just want to zoom out a little bit, think about the those conditions, so people in a place, as it were. Another way of getting at the, the people of this site is to think about them in terms of the, the place that they've occupied, the conditions that are apparent there, the, the, the ways of life that people were leading within that structure. So I want to focus in on the Broch, our major monumental roundhouse, five metre thick walls, 21 and a half metres external diameter, and 11 metre internal space on the uh, the interior of the structure, considerable and complex uh, structure. And it's yielded incredible evidence, one of the most cohesive and coherent floor plans of any Broch excavated uh, to date. And indeed, it must be one of the most coherent and cohesive floor plans of any Iron Age roundhouse excavated anywhere in Britain or Europe, for that matter. So it's a remarkable thing for us, an incredible survival. It's um, the, the way out, can I say, in inverted commas, the way out is very logical in the sense that it all coheres around a series of coaxial passageways that connect and interconnect each of the rooms. And so it does present itself almost as a sort of a single phase entity, even though we know, in fact, uh, on the basis of the excavation of the floor deposits, that there's been a considerable amount of time spent within the, the Brock up to 200 or more years um, from probably the latter part of the first century BC through to around about AD 200 before it was given up altogether. And we've managed to envelop the Brock in a, a, a litany of radiocarbon dates to substantiate the chronology of the, the structure even more than I've depicted here, to be honest. So there's great architectural three-dimensional upstanding upright partitions and divisions that lay out the space inside the Brock. But as well as those, um, of course, the, the coup de grace effectively, the, the counterpart to the hard shell of the architecture is the soft connective tissue of the floor deposits. And again, as I said, we're very lucky to have very good preservation extant floor deposits, occupation material and formerly laid floors, um, which are very rich in environmental and artifactual materials of one kind or another, and I'll show you a few of those in just a moment. Um, so it's lovely to be able to, to peer into this lovely, greasy, unctuous, organic and rich material that is the detritus of people's day-to-day -day lives, and to be able to see this in a series of layers and phases that show us the, the recurrent activities inside the, the building. And this is just another slide of some of the beautiful red and orange peat ash layers and black peat ash layers that are present here in the floors of, in this particular case, in the northeast room. Um, just for a moment, if we think about the uh, look at the southeast room, um, so that's over here on that side of the inside of the, the Brock building. It's got a big hearth, uh, which you can see in the center of the image here or close up here. It's uh, merely a firecracked slab that's laid down on the on the hard clay floors, a sort of beaten earth floor. And that hearth was, was so heavily heated over a period of time that it started to crack and break up and, and may have been partially replaced. In fact, indeed, it was replaced um, on a slightly different spot later on. And there's a little close up of that hearth. You can see the black, rich organics of it as well. So it's every evidence that, that this was a, a kind of quite a busy um, area where people were engaged in cooking and in processing and um, uh, things, and, and, and of course, absorbing the heat of the hearth and the light that it gave within that partition southeast room. <laughs> 
oops, I don't know, that slide's got in there. And just a close up of the, those floors in the southeastern, we can see the rich black organics um, intermingled with the clay of the floor, the weighed clay floor itself. And the artifacts from there, quite rich from the south and southeast room, uh, bone tools. This may be a, the handle of a bow drill. This is made in red deer antler. Core stone tool, so called, so a hammer grinder here, um, a spindle world, perhaps in the process of being crafted actually, because it's a bit rougher than the ones that we normally see from site and therefore it might not be quite complete. And then bone mounts like this one, or rather antler mounts like this one, and a little antler scoop or um, yeah, a little scoopy spatulate kind of tool. So there's evidence in the southeast room of quite people being quite industrious, utilising stone tools and bone tools quite heavily. And similarly, perhaps probably, in fact, processing food, so pounding and grinding up and processing cereals like the barley and, and maybe other plant materials as well, largely for consumption, but perhaps, you know, other types of things going on as well, perhaps even medicines and other sorts of um, things that they're doing with uh, processing organics. Um, there's evidence for more evidence for textile production from that area as well in the form of <coughs> excuse me uh, beautiful bone needles more spindle whorls um uh, a probable loom weight um, and even that bone object that antler object that mount that i showed in the last slide may be involved in uh, textile production it may be part of a fragment of some kind of loom perhaps a back strap loom or something like that perhaps part of the frame of a loom um, it's not entirely clear and may never be entirely clear. And then animal remains from this south and southeast room are really interesting because there's lots of seal, um, the so wild animal in that sense, you know, not just the usual triptych of the domestic animals of cattle, sheep, and pig, but from the south and southeast room of the, the brock itself, lots and lots of evidence for wild animals of, of one kind or another, and particularly in the towards the end of the, the life of uh, the southeast room. But here you can see seal shoulder blade and uh, humerus, etc. So probably a joint of meat actually involved in the, the shoulder portion of the, the seal itself. And also from that area, more seal, a bit of red deer from the end of the, the structure and some swan there as well. Now we can contrast that south and southeast room with what's going on in the west room, and that's over, <laughs> logically enough, that's over on that, that side of the Brock interior. And here it's a very different story in terms of the sort of physical nature of the place itself. There's an awful lot more paving and hard stony floor slabs that are laid down within this structure. Again, there's a massive hearth sat within it and it's so uh, actively used that over time floors are brought in to replace earlier floors and hearth is built upon hearth upon hearth over time. It's a very busy room indeed. Um, and just to give you a sense of that, this is operating in cycle. So this is the sort of start point of that, the northern part of that west room. You can see the heavy paving stones. You can see this is the this is the primary hearth. This is the earliest hearth that we've encountered, highlighted in the pinky red, and stonework or slabby, uh, small flaggy um, floors across the piece, interspersed with really rich black organic material, carbonized material, relatively rich in barley and other organic items when we've been excavating it, sampling it and uh, sorting that material. And then after that, uh, in fairly short order, um, the, there's so much activity going on in that building, in fact, that the hearth starts to sort of spread out, lose its identity and focus a little bit. Meanwhile, the heavy slabs are covered over by organic deposits, um, particularly over that side. New flagstone floors are brought in to, to bring up the floor level, arguably against the hearth and these deposits. And then after a while, it may be a few generations, um, they start again, they lay down more flagstone floors, they lay down a new hearth, a kind of wedge shaped or trapezoidal shaped hearth over here, and then um, even more uh, frenetic or um, dense concentration of slabs, um, but also with still plenty of these black organic deposits forming at the same time. And then that in itself, gives way to another cycle, as it were, within that same west room, where there's new slabs, the slab area is renewed, um, more large uh, slabs are placed down, and a new hearth slab is placed down as well. And then after a reasonable 
time period. It's difficult to gauge that at this moment. You then have a situation where, again, that hearth, the, the waste material from that hearth, the peat ash, is forming a great mound over the top of it, which spreads out from beyond that rectangular slab and starts to, to spread out across more of the room. And then a, a short time after that, perhaps, the West Room then reaches a stage where it's actually becoming worked down the way it's starting to lose um, the structural um, divisions that these are the author stats are starting to become covered over rubble is coming into the building it's really the end of those cycles it's, it spells the end of the structure probably just shortly before AD 200 now uh, I have to thank Mandy Daly for this Mandy is one of our relatively recent master's students uh, who did her dissertation on uh, several of the areas inside the Brock and looked at the remains and the materials, tried to quantify and qualify the nature of both the environmental remains and the artifactual material. And that's been very illuminating and very instructive in terms of what the content of the, the West Room and the, the South Room have been within the Brock. And here you can see some of Mandy's handiwork. So she's laying out in this slide, she's laying out lots of burnt bone, lots of chips and fragments of burnt bone. And then also much larger fragments of unburnt bone where they're much more readily identifiable and we can characterize them. And then here you can see a little Petri dish full of barley grains as well from these black rich organic deposits. Now in the in the West Room in particular, one of the things that's very became very obvious when Ingrid Mainland, my colleague who's a, an archaeozoologist looked at the, the bone is that there's a huge amounts of red deer from that West Room in particular. Uh, and many of them are the little metacarpals and metatarsals, the little lower parts of the leg bones, just reaching the foot bone of the deer itself. And the very many of these have been broken, burnt and cracked and marrow extracted in a very similar fashion that suggests roasting and scorching and marrow extraction for consumption. So there's a very particular type of food practice un underway, it would seem, within that West Room in particular. And it happens over time across all of those cycles. There's a huge volume of red deer being consumed from the very start, perhaps as early as the first century BC or earlier, through to about AD 200. It's a real, really characteristic interest and aspect of the animal bone from that room and the diet of the individuals in there. And it's easy to see in that context, potentially, when we're dealing with these kind of roasted portions and haunches of meat uh, and marrow extraction. It's, it's perhaps easy to see how things like that, the person bee tooth, has perhaps come out and dislodged because there's a huge amount of consumption, arguably feasting going on in this West Room in particular. And uh, it's easy to see how someone could come a cropper. Uh, and lose the odd tooth in the context of, of, of all of that consumption, that very rich dietary signature that we're getting from that, that room. As well as um, environmental remains, of course, we've got lots of artifactual materials. This is just from the last couple of seasons of excavation, just a plot showing the, the spread and distribution and density of finds across the piece, a variety of different kinds across the Brock interior. And these as well are given us some deep insights into the the, the West Room and its contrastive nature to other areas within the Brock. And in the West Room in particular, there's huge amounts of pottery, broken and smashed pottery, large pieces of broken pottery that have been getting loaded onto the hearth and utilized and then coming off. And in some cases, after a while, pots are breaking and smashing. In other cases, it even seems that some of the pottery vessels are being deliberately laid when they're creating the new floor surfaces. So they're placing pottery just underneath um, the new flag floors and the like, as if they're actually leaving these deposits deliberately as a kind of intentional act of closure on one episode and foundation for the next floor layer, perhaps. Now, the interesting thing about the animal bone, um, and I'll push on quite quickly, but the interesting thing about the animal bone is how it contrasts, how this inventory of, of species that are present within the broch contrasts with what's going on outside the broch. Um, so, the interesting thing is that in descending order, the most numerous species found inside the broch are deer and cattle, then seal, then young pig, then sheep or goat, difficult to tell them apart archaeologically very often, then fish, and then whale. So that's that's the, the hierarchy of species. Now in the village buildings that surround the broch, we find a much more typical for the Middle Iron Age um, roster of species. So sheep and goat 
about a third of all the animal bones represented by sheep or goat. Similarly, about a third are cattle. Then at 14% pig, some adult, but uh, generally adult, but some juvenile as well. Then bird bones, then horse, fish, deer, seal, cat, otter, and whale. So you can see there's quite a marked contrast between what's going on inside the brock in terms of the numeracy of certain species and those in, in the village outside. And that may relate perhaps uh, to the differential role of the, the inhabitants of the brock, or it may relate to the differential utilization of the brock. In other words, it's possible to argue that there's a hierarchy of people here, not just of species in that sense, in the sense that perhaps some of these food items are more high status than some of the others. And therefore, the, those inhabitants of the brock have access to these types of foodstuffs. On the other hand, it may simply be that the whole of the village community there at the Cairns went inside the brock and had these communal feasts and consumed these special meals inside the brock. And over the next few seasons, we hope to be able to demonstrate which of those two scenarios uh, is actually closer to reality or whether it's some more complex than that again. But it's an interesting um, hypothesis and uh, or twin hypothesis to potentially follow. So I mentioned the internal arrangements of the brock, they're very cohesive, very coherent. But the thing that we have to point out is that the the whole of the um, uh, the uh, the inventory of animals from the brock I've just characterised as an assemblage in contrast to what's going on outside, but there's a bit more complexity than that, that it gives us an insight into people's lives. And I, I think may even be given as an insight into social structures, kin structures, um, and ways in which people um, uh, organised and structured their society. So this is this is how you entered the broch. You came in through the main entrance. There's an inner entrance passageway, and you followed that round to the left-hand side. If you wanted to enter the southeast room that I've been talking about, uh, with its great hearth, and then from there into the two mural chambers, the two wall chambers set in the wall there, or from there you could move into the south room. Um, and you could then move into the intramural staircase, the gallery with stairs that runs up within the thickness of the wall of the brock and would eventually turn you out into an upper floor, an entire upper floor, almost certainly, that was perched above the ground floor inside the brock. Now, you notice these two rooms are communicable, but they don't communicate, they don't share access with the other three major rooms inside the brock. And in order to access those, you would have to, again, retrace your steps if you were allowed to and and come into the uh, back to the inner entrance passage into a central room. It's not much more of a corridor, much more than a corridor space. From there, you could enter the west room that I was talking about with all its red deer and its lavish um, uh, dining that's going on in there. From there, you could enter a, a chamber in the wall or again, from that central room, you could go into the north room where you could access that subterranean structure, the well, or indeed the chamber is set in the wall. And from that north room, you could also communicate with the northeast room. So you could wander in there and from there into another chamber set in the wall. And then the reason that we've got two tone question marks up on the wall head is that there's a fragment of gallery set at an upper level at first floor level second floor if you're american and that gallery is a fragment and we don't know where, how that gallery was accessed it may well have been a gallery that ran round the circumference of a large part of the brock itself but we don't know where it was accessed from so it's difficult to say whether it was accessed from that the, the one of these suites or the other suite of rooms within the brock so what you're seeing here is a bipartite division inside the Brock. There's a, a very much a sense that there are two apartments, two suites of rooms, uh, a northern suite that is uh, that has the west room, the north room and the northeast room, and a southern suite that has the south room and the southeast room. And, and in each of those suites, there's a major room that contains a major hearth, as if we're dealing with a, you know, quite a a division of activities revolving around twin hearths within the structure and quite rigidly divided out so that those two suites don't even communicate with each other directly, but you have to access them via a kind of coaxial entrance way, the inner entrance passageway in the central room. 
And what do we find, um, to summarise, what are we finding within these um, bar pi bipartite divisions? Well, I've said already, on the one hand, in the western and north-northeast suite, we've got copious pottery, whereas in the other suite, in the south-southeast room, very little pottery. Personal adornment items, uh, I'll show you some pictures of those in a minute, lots of glass beads and toggles and bronze jewellery and the like. And on the other hand, in the south southeast room, very few of those kinds of personal adornment items. Copious animal bone and fewer animal bones in the in in here, uh, but it does include seal. Copious red deer, very little red deer. No is maybe too emphatic, but very little red deer. Barley grains, but not much processing waste present in the that suite in the western suite. Cereal processing waste, rachis fragments and like that's to say evidence that people are processing cereals in situ within the south and southeast suite. And that's not so evident at all in the west room. Um, no bone tools really present in the western suite and bone tools present in the southern. Fewer stone tools in the west, copious stone tools in the south southeast. Very few quern stones for grinding grain and other things present in the western suite, whereas in the south and southeast room, there's actually there's quite a lot of querns present um, across the lifespan of that, that room. So quite striking differences between the inventories and the dispositions and the nature and qualities of, of those two rooms. Here's some of the decorated pottery that's come out of the West Room in particular, lots of nice chevron and dot decoration, decorated collars, um, these little maggot decorations, uh, little lozenge and uh, zigzag decorations, that's probably a fragment of more zigzag and double zigzag, and fingernail impressions as well. And Neil Sharple is a very well-known Iron Age scholar, has suggested that in the Middle Iron Age, um, decorated pottery, one of the few, the few types of objects that are decorated in the early and the Middle Iron Age period, are decorated precisely because they're connected to feasting and of sharing food and the kind of slight um, commensality and show-offy nature of feasting and hosting guests uh, and honoured individuals and groups who might come and visit you from time to time. And this decorated pottery is, is, is sort of, is part of the paraphernalia of hosting um, those sorts of uh, occasions, Sharples argues. And here's some of the glass beads from the West Room, from Brock. This one's a Roman type, but there's others here that are Iron Age type. Most of them are Iron Age types. Tiny little blue ones like this from the West Room that have come out of the environmental sample, sieving and sorting. You can see just how tiny it is by comparison with the 20p there. Fragments of Roman glass like this uh, piece here that come out of the West Room. Uh, beautiful aqua colored toggle uh, dumbbell bead that's come out of the West Room as well. So let's think about this again for a second. So let's come back to these kind of dichotomies again. So within that bipartite division, again, those two suites. In the in the west and north suite, we've got mixed hard slab floors and black organics, contrasting with soft floors in the south suite. Black, greasy, charcoal, rich organics derived from hearth waste. And on the other hand, red and yellow clay floors, laid clay floors, quite sterile red and yellow clay. Unadorned plain wall chambers on the one hand and clay lined wall chambers in the south and southeast rooms, uh, where they're actually laying clay, impressed in some cases with uh, limpet shells, um, almost decoratively, whoops, uh, in the in the southeast uh, room. And then in the west and northeast room suite, and this is quite important, um, access to the well staircase, the underground stepped chamber down beneath the broch is accessed from one complex, one suite, one part of the bipartite division. And then on the other hand, access to the upper floors of the broch are achieved uh, via the intramural staircase only in the south and southeast room. So the access point upstairs to the upper floors is achieved only, as far as we can tell, from uh, the south and southeast complex. So intermission, just a lovely picture of a lovely saddle quern in situ. Most of them are actually recovered, apparently deposited almost as closing deposits or offerings as such, uh, rather than as in working stances. And this one is the only one that, or one of the very few that we can point to on site that seems to be actually in a working stance. Right, and then to take this a little bit further, again, wrapped around these two dichotomies, 
thinking about the qualities of experience and the, the practices and activities underway. So in the West and North area, we've got, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, food preparation, cooking, consumption, uh, pottery vessels, large quantities of burnt and unburnt bone that evoke all that. Vessels and consumption are very much um, indicated. Waste residue from that process is left around. Um, lots of personal adornment objects. Um, and what I've said here is that this is sort of betokening performative identities, um, let's just say. Um, there's an overarching kind of stone and a hardness, a solidity to the West Room. There's a colour palette in there, effectively, whether intentional or otherwise, that leads to a very black um, a kind of colour palette within that, that, that area. And kind of we're looking at things like serving and perhaps feasting and perhaps hospitality in that zone. And then the other zone, by contrast, tools and production, uh, the produ productive capacity is of the of that part of the house is very emphasised. Um, lots of tools, so working identities, I've said, in contrast to the performative ones. Uh, clay, clay floors and clay lined uh, chambers, this kind of softness and a smoothness to that. Um, and a colour palette that involves reds and yellows very strongly. Um, and uh, activities that revolve around work and processing and making things and craft in in those senses so again really interesting kind of bipolar um uh inventories of objects qualities experiences within these two major suites within the broch and of course it does as well to remember that there are two separate hearth principal hearths within these bipartite uh uh, uh areas and in anthropology, we tend we do tend to think of hearts as being the beating heart of non-Western traditional societies, and to have two of these sat within the brock and to maintained over a long period of time in quite separate quarters of the structure, I think is kind of indicating that we're dealing with quite a a division within the character of the household. Also, that there's a a, a dividing out of that household in very in very characteristic or very strong sorts of ways and that they have we can almost call these two hearth groups the groups of household householders who preside and reside within these these areas now the question here is that many archaeologists would would perhaps think of this this division division of labor a division of space a division of access uh divisions of different categories and qualities of materials and experiences and some archaeologists would look at that and think does this be token very strong and strict gender divisions within the house so we're dealing here with male groups a male residency group and a female residency group and there's at least since the 1970s very famous anthropologists and sociologists like Pierre Bourdieu have have um, produced ethnographic um, records of groups like the Berbers in North Africa and how their household arrangements were very much structured around gender and gendered divisions of labour and identity with differential access and and, and in some cases some archaeologists would look at the, the slew of anthropological evidence for that kind of lifestyle in a whole number of non-Western societies and apply that to the archaeology and say uh, are we dealing here with a, a very patriarchal society in which women are almost sequestered and kept in a particular zone of a house. Now, we cannot at this distance chronologically, hand on heart, suggest that, that one of these areas represents a female domain and one of them represents male. Although I have to say, with the increase in DNA evidence and these little fragments and traces of human that we're getting from the site and their association with one or other of these areas and with dietary patterns that perhaps match one or other of the sets of, of dietary activities that are going on inside the structure, I think we are getting closer to perhaps suggesting that there may well be a gender division or structure within this house. On the other hand, what I want to suggest to you is that there's another scenario. And while I don't subscribe to, to it any more than I do the patriarchal model of this uh, Baroque uh, pattern, it's worth consideration. And that other scenario is the matrilocal social group in which, and here are some of the features of matrilocal groups um, that anthropologists tell us uh, very um, 
uh, something. Th these are the tendencies and the trends that are typical of matrilocal groups, where you have groups of women co-resident, large groups of women co-resident within structures, and it's the males that marry into those household communities, and males are therefore more mobile across landscapes and across regions. Now, the features of these sorts of societies, as evidenced by the, the cross-cultural anthropological files, are large house floor spaces. This is to accommodate large groups of women. And in the anthropological literature, would you believe that we were able, even able to put a bit of a metric on this? So matrilocal houses often tend to be 100 metres square or larger. And patrilocal residences where women marry into the community tend to be less than 60 metres square. Now, our brock at the Cairns, the ground floor alone, is 95 metres square. But of course, that doesn't take on board the fact that there are rooms and chambers set within the walls, and also that there was at least one upper storey and quite likely a, a third storey of the building, taking it up to many hundreds of metres. Um, in terms of the square metrage available within that structure. So that's just an aside, but it's worth bearing in mind that these major monumental structures that we've always known as brochs and have happily accommodated them within quite a number of quite patriarchal models of society, shall I say, fit in some regards, fit more a matrilocal model. These are the other features of matrilocal social groups. They often practice very intense farming, arable farming uh, activities, almost horticultural in nature, where they're incessantly and feverishly weeding and improving the soil conditions and building up enhanced soil areas. That's something we see in the Middle Iron Age in particular of the north of uh, the uh, Scottish Atlantic region, so Orkney and Shetland in particular. We do see these arable infields produced around rocks. In those matrilocal societies, material culture tends to be simple, tools and equipment, objects that relate to daily practices, um, not so much of your flashy, um, blingy sort of material culture, your, your personal adornment, your jewellery, etc. We also tend to see house layout in those matrilocal societies is quite interesting because the female space is often quite accessible, open, accommodating and the, the male area, it, it tends to be as more sequestered rather than the other way around. So male space tends to be either restricted or difficult of access or hived off separately from the rest of the structure. Now, we remember what I was saying about the fact that the staircase up into the upper story of the broch actually issues from the south and southeast room of the broch. And so it's arguable that uh, that that one of these suites has an even larger area within the house within the Brock House itself, and interestingly, and I think quite fascinatingly, that that's interesting because that would mean that the upper elements of the Brock, if if that south and southeast suite was associated with with women's activities and residency and and activity, then that would mean they also have that access up to the upper stories, and then that rather turns on its head the traditional view of of Brox as being these great monumental edifices reaching up into the sky, very masculinist in nature, almost phallic in nature indeed. And instead of that, that rather comically, I think, that, that tends to say, if we followed this model through, we'd actually be looking at a situation where the upper reaches of Brox are more symbolic of female activity than male. And then as a final point here, warfare is often conducted out with the region. Um, you don't see a lot of internal conflict within matrilocal societies because the requirement to have marriage partners coming in from across the region, um, marrying into female residencies, means that you have a situation where that, that lessens the tensions between young men across a region. And what they tend to do instead is they prosecute warfare between one region and another. So they go further, there's further distance involved in conflict and saber rattling within those kinds of matrilocal and matrilineal descent groups. Um, who's in these matrilocal groups? Um, typically, again, from the anthropological files, there's the mother, a mother at any point in time within the, the household, her sisters, her brothers, her daughters, her sister's children, and her grand grandchildren. 
but typically not her brother's children or her son's children. They're they're destined to go off into other communities, particularly the males are destined to go off uh, and be present within other houses and the households at marriage, um, and their descent pattern will shear off into other directions. So <laughs> I'm, I'm only introducing this stuff as an interesting thought experiment. You know, it, it's all too easy to, to use the, the kind of assumptions of our society over the last 100, 200 years and the gender identities and nature and qualities that have been ascribed and to back project them into the deep past. And so as a bit of a thought experiment, what I'm doing here is, is try, trying to evade and avoid that inevitable patriarchal um, sequestered women put in their place honoured in a sense, but largely captives within the household environment. I kind of turn that on its head and, and sort of invoke the idea that maybe we've been getting this wrong all along and that we're looking at matrilocal descent rather than uh, and uh, matrilocal residency rather than matrilineal descent rather than patrilocal. Now, there's a cautionary note here. Uh, some of you might know that over the 19th and early 20th centuries, a part of the late Iron Age or um, the Pictish or early medieval period was often thought to be matrilocal and matrilineal in nature. Um, and the, the, really the only academic evidence for that was the fact that some of the, the Pictish king lists never repeated names. So it didn't look like there was direct descent, but perhaps that the descent was going down the female line rather than the male line. Um, that's really a, that's a mistake actually and there's and that evidence has been rightly poo-pooed um and and even in the 19th century there were even statements made by some scholars like oh well the the women of the northeast of scotland particularly in areas like dundee are very strong and strong-willed and therefore this must have some bearing on their ancestors who you know must have been these very strong matriarchal <laughs> members of society so really uh, silly and simplistic and, and wrong-headed stuff and I don't want to perpetuate and perpetrate such similarly simplistic and stupid ideas about uh, the earlier part of the Iron Age. But I do think it's quite intriguing that we may be looking at a situation, we could be looking at a situation where there's change underway across the period of the, the Long Iron Age. In the early and middle Iron Age, let's just suggest for a moment that there was this matrilineal and matrilocal residency uh, and uh, and um, uh, and descent. And here you've got uh, the Brock at the Howe, uh, which is much more typical in terms of its layout, it has to be said, than, than the Cairns appears to be at the moment in terms of previously excavated examples. So you can see the concentric and radial layout. So big communal open area space with a big central hearth placed in the middle and relatively even access into that central arguably public area, that public domain within the centre and these radial partitions, bays along the side. So you've got that and that contrasts with the bipartite division that's seen inside the Brock at the Cairns. And I can't help but wondering if the Brock at the Cairns being a relatively late example as we think it is, you know, later part of the first century BC onwards, that there's already change underway within the structure of households uh, from this more concentric and radial tendency that we see in the earlier and the middle and the early part of the middle iron age to this bipartite division in the in the later iron age now the next step from ad 200 and beyond onwards is to to dissolve this monumental circular architecture altogether in favour of rectilinear buildings. And buildings like these, these rectangular wags, in this case, the, the type site, the wag of force and caithness, constructed actually into and over the remains of the Broch um, building that force itself. And these rectangular buildings extrude a, an even more kind of um, an extended linearity to the household structure. There's internal divisions and partitions within them that um, evoke some of that bipartite structure that I've suggested for the, the Brock at the Cairns. And here's our version of this from the Cairns, our structure B, which is a, a well, there's actually three structures here, B2, B1, and, and the remains of B3 just coming out the edge of our trench. And again, this is bipartite division. It's a flagged area with a hearth on the west side, and then a major, major monumental hearth on the east side um, with um, earthen floors. Uh, there instead. So again, we're starting to see these kind of, we're seeing these kind of qualities of space picked out differentially within it. And uh, again, Neil Sharples and others have commented on this architectural development as an extension of hierarchy, that the communal 
massive monumental buildings of the big round houses and brochs in the early and middle Iron Age give way to these smaller um, but architecturally complex buildings and structures in the late Iron Age. And that what we're seeing here is the development of hierarchy and status, um, where buildings actually become less important in invoking the status of individuals in favour of these sorts of things, or rather the products of these things. These are clay moulds used to make jewellery from the same uh, phase of the site as the rectilinear building, structure B buildings there. And these are making beautiful sunburst decorated ring-headed pins, uh, penannular brooches, uh, simple shaft pins. Here again, penannular brooch, uh, another little penannular ring. And these are items which people could carry with them. They could wander across the landscape. They could visit other regions. They could display their status and their wealth and their ability to produce items in the milieu and the high fashion of that particular day in the up to the middle of the first millennium AD and a little bit beyond. And what I would suggest perhaps is that along with that increase in hierarchy that Sharples and others uh, archaeologists have argued for the late Iron Age, what it boils down to is that prefiguring that or perhaps more realistically interweaving with it, there's a, there's a household structuring change, there's a change in the nature of families, households, uh, the ways in which people relate to each other and structure their affairs within houses. And this is militating towards increasing hierarchy it permits that hierarchy or hierarchization to occur in the later Iron Age. So here's some of these structures, here's some of these brochs again that have been the subject of study for over 150 years now. They are wonderful structures, many have been excavated but only partly, very few have been excavated to the extent that the Cairns is with a few modern exceptions um, and really what we need to do is is excavate more of these. We have to look back on the old excavations and reinterpret, re-understand them, apply new analytical techniques to the materials that came from those older excavations wherever we can. Um, but we hope that the Cairns is going to make a, a major contribution to understanding the deeper underlying structures, including the, even the kin structures and the household structures of these people's lives uh, 2,000 and more years ago. And I'll leave it there. You'll be glad to hear and simply just wanted to finish off by reminding you, you can go and visit the exhibition, <laughs> Strumness Museum, the Cairns living in the landscape from now until the end of, of October. And other than that, I just wanted to say thanks very much to everyone uh, on this list and many others also, but uh, by no means least uh, our landowners and lovely hosts, Charlie and Yvonne Nicholson and family, uh, amongst many others and all the dig team. And we'll be back on site uh, this year from the 13th of June uh, to the 8th of July, and you can come and visit us. Um, we operate an open site um, as long as COVID doesn't close us down again or some other virus or some other set circumstances. We operate an open site, but on the 1st of July, we'll be having an open day, a special open day, um, at which you will even be able to hear the sounds of the Iron Age, um, where we are reconstructing Carmix. That's to say a, a trumpet or a horn will be blown <laughs> to extol the sounds of the, the Iron Age that haven't been heard for a couple of thousand years. So without any further ado, I'll stop at that. Thank you very much, Martin. We may have hesitated and stumbled in the early stages technologically, but you didn't miss a beat in your presentation, Martin. <laughs> And, uh, and it's what we've come to expect from Martin Carruthers, a uh, 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 contextual situating of the Iron Age itself, um, the place of the Cairns Broch in that context, uh, and then at the end, widening out to take a, a wider look at Brochs elsewhere. But I think tonight's talk was particularly characterised by the drilling down to the human elements of the broch has have been revealed by the artifactual remains and the, and now the increasingly clearer archaeological divi um, architectural divisions within the broch and the potential um, conclusions that can be drawn from that. But of course, it wouldn't be a Martin Carruthers presentation if he didn't throw into the mix a couple of very interesting and no doubt controversial speculations uh, founded, I have to say, upon uh, hard uh, potential evidence of the notion of matrilocal or patrilocal elements, which uh, is fascinating and, of course, is dynamite. <laughs>
and just once again shows the, the relevance of archaeology in pointing up aspects of our present day uh, society today. So, Martin, thank you very much for uh, for your presentation. I'm conscious that time is tight on us, but I do want to give people the opportunity to ask questions if they wish. And if I can just pick two from the, the comments, if I may, Martin, you might want to think about it. Uh, one of our uh, what one of our members wanted to know if there's been any attempt to overlay the whale bone remains, the whale remains with the human remains uh, in terms of your mapping of the broch. And uh, another question that came up at the end in the anthropological structures, has there been any possible comparisons done with other round anthropological structures like yurts or kraals? There's a couple of questions for starters, Martin. You may wish to respond or not to respond to them, yeah. and we'll see if there's other questions that come up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so taking the last of those first, I suppose, yeah, in the anthropological literature, the, the presence of quite large circular structures has often been identified as, as part of the, I suppose, the tradition of great houses, or often they've been equated with house societies. And some of you will be familiar with Colin Richards' discussion of house societies yeah. in relation to Neolithic Orkney. Um, and I think it's arguable that the, the society's investing of time and effort and materials and resources on houses is often an indication of house societies as anthropologists understand them. Um, and I, I do think that Iron Age Orkney and Iron Age the north of Scotland for that matter, maybe Iron Age Britain in fact, uh, is characterizable by a series of house societies. And again, the interesting thing about that is that in a less well-known aspect of house societies, in the anthropological literature is that a larger than average proportion of them tend to be matrilocal, which is kind of intriguing. And when it comes to things like kraals, you know, and kind of things that you would find in parts of Central and Southern Africa, again, quite a lot of circular structures, there's a there's a huge variety of, of different forms of residency, um, matrilocal, patrilocal, and indeed um, bilateral residency, where there's a mixture of, of um, uh, lineage, uh, descent, and residency patterns within them. So you can't point necessarily to circular structures and say they're inherently matrilocal in nature. Um, I think you have to, to take on board a whole slew of other factors involved in that as well in order to to evince the argument in any one particular archaeological case that the that you would, you could be dealing with matrilocal. And I put this out tonight just as, partly as a bit of fun, although it's a serious area of inquiry that I'm following through on and trying to, to, to peer into and see if we can specify and look into it. Um, ideally, love the idea of being able to, to, to qualify who's in that house, as it were, and where they are within that house and, and what their identities are. And it may well be that there are other identities. In fact, almost certainly there are other identities at work within the structure of the household as well. But I do think, feel that the the, the patterns that we're seeing may evoke strong gender identities at any rate. Um, the, the first question there, uh, could you remind me about that, David, what that one was? I never quite yeah, it, it was a question that in the mapping of the whale remains and the human remains outside the brock, or indeed mm -hmm. perhaps inside the brock too, has there been, a, has there been an attempt yet to, uh, to map them on top of each other to see if there are... Um, uh, contingencies or um, repetitions? Well, the, the, certainly the, the, the major whalebone deposit that I showed in the slide with the, the 19 or so fragments of the fin whale that's genetically fingerprinted to a likely single individual, the, 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 the person A, the elder as we've nicknamed them, they very much um, are contained within that whalebone vessel. So this is wonderful because it means that all the rest of the whalebone comes into sharp focus through the DNA work. We know that the rest of that, that whale carcass it belongs to a single individual, and this is part of an elaborate structured abandonment process of that broth. Um, so we know that there's a very intimate and direct connection between them. Um, the elder, as we've called her, person A, she died sometime round about the time that the broth was put out of use, maybe a year or two before in order to allow decomposition, defleshing and disarticulation, although they could have hastened that process by various means that don't reveal archaeological traces. The broth has come into an end at that point in time. Um, and uh, the whale 
happened to strand presumably sometime around that point in time as well. So you've got these various giants involved in the end process of the broch. Uh, and I think there is quite a tight and strongly connected and elaborate process that's going on. And I, if people are interested in it, I, I gave a talk before that's been recorded for OES for Brochtoberfest, in which I went into much more detail about the abandonment and decommissioning of the broch. I went into the detail of what they're trying to do. And it is a really weird and wonderful story in its own right, and much, much more detailed than, of course, I could talk about this evening. But it's, it's a fascinating episode in and of itself. And it utilizes the elder's remains. Her, her remains are incorporated within that process of abandonment. And if you think about it when she was in her youth if she's 50 to 70 years or more when she was in her youth that broch was in its heyday and i think very much she's probably a member of that household of that broch household and probably either achieved or held status within that household community based on her longevity indeed uh, itself and then the way in which her it's her remains that are singled out for deposition as the as that kind of final closing deposit um, the most elaborate deposit of all she's singled out or a piece of her is singled out for deposition you can't help but feel there's some particular importance invested in her as an individual within that process very interesting martin yes and t timber uh, a question about any any timber remains um only very small fragments really because um I suppose because of the very deliberate nature of the the way in which the broch was abandoned, we can well imagine that as they're removing the upper the upper elements of the superstructure of the broch, the the they're then they're removing timber elements, any timber elements that might still have been present at that stage, possibly reusing, recycling, or using them as fuel. Um, so we don't have much in the way of large timber elements surviving, very little in fact. Lots of other preserved and carbonized organics, but nothing that you can point to that looks like structural timber as such. And I think that's as much as anything is a, a token of the, the very deliberate and very structured and methodical abandonment of the broch itself. Other brochs obviously accidentally burnt down, like Clachtal Broch in Assen, recently excavated by uh, AOC Archaeology and those wonderful excavations uh, with the Assen uh, Historic Landscape Group. and. Uh, it's a wonderful site, accidentally burnt down a few suggestions of timbers, but not masses of them. And then other Brock sites like um, uh, Scalloway in uh, Shetland, have, they've recovered slightly larger timbers from that situation. Again, an accidental conflagration that gave rise to the end of the Brock. Um, but again, that Brock was up and running for uh, until apparently until AD 500. So there's there's who knows whether or not the timbers that were consumed in that fire actually represent anything like the way in which that broch was originally kitted out, floored, furnitured, fitted and roofed, um, or whether that was something that had changed quite radically by that time, up to four or five hundred years after it was constructed, if not more. So it's really difficult to get evidence for the organic elements of the architecture itself. Whalebone is also another another very respectable architectural element, of course, and you can do a lot with whalebone, large pieces of rib, for instance, that you can use within buildings, although I suspect in most brochs, the, the volumetric kind of um, extents and lengths of things that we're dealing with and sizes of things, even the largest of whale ribs probably couldn't have coped entirely with the supporting and propping roofs and the like to so timber okay. okay thank you for that martin okay let's move on to the last two questions if i may martin the first one wants to reprise the issue of person a uh, the elderly female it uh, might mm. she be um supporting evidence for the matrilocal society and the second one i'll just give you the second one as well you can decide how your uh, time you're going to take on them how far above the primary floor deposits do you think you are and might there yet be a classic broch radial foot plan mm. underneath everything mm -hmm. good questions both of them uh take the first one first yes i was probably a bit too implicit about it but i you know w within my you know thought experiment of the the potential matrilocality and matrilineality of that um, household. 
we've got to bear in mind the marine protein signature that was very evident in that woman's remains. We don't know whether that's in the latter part of her life or whether it's across her life course. We hope we'll get that information very soon from the COMEOS Isotopes and Genetics project that we're part of because that's precisely what they're peering into at this moment. So I'll probably get an email from them tomorrow yielding this evidence frustratingly, but I can't can't say for sure right now. But yes, yeah, she's got a high marine signature that's unusual supposedly unusual in, in middle iron age terms although we're seeing a bit more complexity with better analysis these days um, and of course the south and southeast room within the brock is characterized by certain types of terrestrial animals for sure but also lots of shellfish and fish bones within the south and southeast area of the brock interior that area that i you know, could putatively argue was the was the was the ground floor part of the female area of that structure, and that contrasts with what we saw in the West Room with all that terrestrial diet, that red meat, red deer, um, uh, cattle, pigs, etc., uh, etc. Et so she might be supportive evidence indeed. And when we get more detail of her life course, as we hope to do with this commerce work, that might close in on that even more. And by the same token, person B in the West Room, who we now know is biologically male, uh, and whose tooth was covered in calculus and plaque and the like, we don't yet have the dietary information from him, but we're going to have both the dietary information locked up in his tooth for his longer life course, and from the analysis of the calculus to see what he was recently eaten before that tooth came out. And so again, it may be that it might give us that dietary signature that's su suggestive of the types of foodstuffs that we're seeing being consumed in that West Room where his tooth was found. So we might be closing in on that kind of, um, the, 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 the sort of triangulation of that, that evidence for who's where within that household. And that, I can't emphasize how, how rare this is. These tiny fragments of people from inside this Brock household are remarkable evidence for the actual household members where we can actually start to think about genetics, kinship, relatedness, the social structure of that household and pin it into the triangulated evidence of the practices and activities underway within that Brock. This is really, really unusual and rare stuff to be able to get that kind of quality of evidence, that fine resolution. It's wonderful stuff, I'm delighted by it all, but we'll wait with bated breath to see what the fuller results come uh, back with. And then, uh, sorry, the, and then the second question there, you might have to remind me again. I've waxed it's, on too lyrically there. Yes, indeed. It's the um, it, it's the one about how close are you to the final floor deposit, oh, yes. do you think? And might there be a radial floor pan underneath everything? Indeed, absolutely. An important question, one we've been thinking about for a number of years in the excavation. Um, we think there's not much room left. And we've got quite a lot of work to do inside the Brock to excavate all the floor deposits on a, a lovely control grid that gives us all this specific spatial evidence for what's going on everywhere. But nevertheless, in three key areas with inside the Brock, we have reached the natural clay underneath the primary floors in small windows where we've been excavating. So we know that we're running out of vertical space in terms of the deposits inside the Brock. And I don't think there is the stubby remains of broken off orthostats that have originally characterized a radial and concentric space. I think that the truth of the matter is the Cairns Brock is a late representative of its type and they're already changing the ways in which they structure households. And I think that's what we're seeing is it's a Brock of the, the latter part of the Middle Iron Age and it's already revealing this development of the structure of households that you know, becomes very much signally different in the rectilinear and cellular buildings of the, the post-Brock era a few centuries after that. So again, that's really remarkable, fine-tuned insight we're getting into the, the, the potential development of these household spaces, which are mediating um, the both the, the, the both the, the the outcome and the medium of this social change that's occurring within uh, society at that time. But no, I don't think we've got any, I don't think we'll have, we could get a surprise yet, uh, but I don't think we're, we've got any room left. Um, I think that original layout is the way it was effectively, or rather the layout that we're seeing now is the way it was laid out from the outset. Okay, Martin, thank you very much for that. Thank you for your responses to the questions that came up and to the thoughtful questions that our members have posed to you. I'm conscious of time, friends, and...
Uh, you've been very patient with the difficulties of technology that we had earlier on. So um, I'd like to draw the meeting to a close. Martin, once again, thank you. You set our minds racing, as you always do when you talk to us about these things. And I know there are many strands in the investigations of the Cairns, but you've brought into focus that intriguing human issue and the idea that we can begin to put together through the detailed painstaking research that your team is doing, the human faces and the human relationships. And from that, the social relationships that underlie the people that lived in and around that broch is very exciting indeed. We do wish you well with the results that are still to come from previous uh, digs. And we hope that 2022 brings you a satisfying and exciting dig. Thank you very much, Martin.